schools, villages, squares, just to talk about um, sexual and reproductive health rights and responsibility. But in recent times, there's a report that there's a surge in HIV AIDS infection in our communities. How did it, how did we come by this? So um, it's a very um, historic issue which started way before us. Yes. Unfortunately, we have come to um, face this challenge as young people and people in communities that do not even have access or safe environment to be able to discuss some of these um, sexual reproductive health related issues. And so if you look at it somewhere 2016, 2015, I think, at the time when the agenda 1990 started by the then first lady and other first ladies across um, Africa. Yeah. What they realized was that um, at the time, it seems we were doing very well in fighting HIV. Okay. Up until the government of Ghana enforced the law that every pregnant woman must go through um, HIV cases, then we realized that the numbers were increasing because now people, whether they like it or not, yeah. had to undergo the, 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 the test. And so that alone increased our number from the point we thought we were addressing it and now the numbers were increasing so high as a result of that intervention but what it has also done is that it has given us the opportunity to protect children mother child transmission okay. and address that issue however for cases that we did not take care of we did not uh, pay attention to because there was no um, it wasn't compulsory for expectant mothers to undergo HIV testing. A lot of young people or children at the time were giving birth and their mothers transmitted this uh, virus to the child. Okay. And so beyond the sexual reproductive health issues which could have caused uh, HIV related cases, there's also the fact that there is mother to child transmission which has happened over the past years. Okay. So currently in Ghana about 1.2% of the cases that we experience between the ages of 15 to 24 years um, it's, it's just 1.2 not just let me choose my words carefully it's 1.2% uh, of this age group the, the cases that we have being between this uh, 15 to 24 years <coughs> and that's very alarming because then it presents the the reality of inadequate access to information about it and also um governments or stakeholders creating safe environment mm. to end stigma against people who willingly go to health facilities or clinics to undergo this test mm -hmm. and so it's something that started way before um you know all the interventions and the progress that we have made mm -hmm. as a country but it's also something that um, we still need to put in a lot mm -hmm. of efforts okay. unfortunately COVID has come in it has come to take attention yeah. from other major ailments that we have and so as to whether the antiretroviral um, drugs are still available more of such resources are still um, whether health facilities are empowered enough to be able to diagnose, to give constant care to HIV patients, to treat, you know, um, young people who are infected with the disease with the necessary care they need because now COVID comes with its own emotional stress. Yeah. And so to even deal with or sitting at the facility and thinking that the next patient coming to me could be a COVID patient. patient alone is enough damage to cause to the um, the health worker. Mm -hmm. So how um, free are their minds to be able to deal with people who come in seeking for mm -hmm. HIV yeah. um, services? So it's, it's, it's an issue that we, we have to open up mm -hmm. to and accept that they do exist, mm -hmm. but also admit that not all of the cases are mm -hmm. as a result of um, and safe sexual practices okay. because some they, they were just born in it and they didn't know yeah. so they go about also um, yeah. infecting others and all that yeah
Okay, so I think this has actually opened my <laughs> wasn't it my brain to a different world because for me I thought it was just uh, people didn't really understand uh, the social reproductive health education and rights responsibility and rights that was going on. So now that you've said uh, two two point five percent are those from mother 1. to one point two are from uh, mother to child. In no, it's from. Um, 15 to 24 so years. So now that we've been able to uh, know this percentage and how it's happening, how can we um, how can we address it yeah. from that point on? We've now identified this is the problem. Now how can we yeah? Start so it, it's very important that we first um, admit that the Ghana East Commission is doing quite a lot. Yeah. Um, there are chances now people go into facilities to do HIV tests Test. willingly. Okay. Now, how safe are these facilities is the first question we have to ask. You see some of these facilities, they are far away from the main facilities. So for instance, TTH, yeah. if you go to TTH, the, the, the center they do the HIV testing, it's a bit isolated okay. from the main facility. Okay. I don't know about now, but then when I used to send HIV patients, okay. it's just a corner, yeah. a, a, a block, yeah. actually. So you go there, and everyone immediately knows that you are coming yeah. for HIV testing. <laughs> so that starts the stigma. Okay. So if it's me, will I willingly go and do that? <laughs> No. So that's the first problem. I understand that there could be medical reasons yeah. for which they isolate the facility. But could it be done in a more supportive way? Say that people will be comfortable enough yeah. to walk in there without fear that my mother's friend or my yeah. church mate, my mom's yeah. so mate will see me. Integration. Integration. Very important. So let's get the facilities. HIV to be part of any other ailment that requires services. Mm -hmm. People have survived it. In fact, the then um, regional director for people living with HIV in the northern region, um, he said he's had the disease for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. And when you look at him, he's okay. You see some signs that, yeah, if you know what yeah, HIV is, yeah, you yeah. see that maybe he's HIV positive. Yeah, but I think there is a celebrity, uh, a basketball player, is it Magic Mike or I've forgotten the name. Yeah, Th there are quite a lot yeah, of people who have Yeah, because he has been giving his soul with the wife for over 30 years and the yeah. wife doesn't even have HIV. Exactly. So the first step, and um, I think for me, every year I used to do HIV testing. So we have to encourage people to, to test. When you test, you know your HIV status, then you can protect the people around you. If you're a mother, you're HIV positive, you can protect a child from getting the virus once detected early. And that's why it has become mandatory. If you're a husband and you're HIV positive, you know how to protect your wife from the virus and your children as well. Now, the important thing when it comes to young people is about access to information about their sexual reproductive health. Now, the issue of CSC, I don't even want to talk about it <laughs> because it was completely misinterpreted and politicized that they lost the relevance of CSC and yeah. what it could have done for our young people. This was an approach of giving them information about understanding their body, understanding their reproductive health, understanding the uh, STDs they are likely to encounter when they engage in unhealthy sexual activities. So it, it came with a whole lot of package, okay. but for a particular thing that we didn't want, we rubbished the entire intervention. <laughs> and, and that's where the, the problem okay. starts. So we need to first admit as religious people, whether you're Muslim, you're Christian, that even 10 year old children get pregnant. And the youngest mother is actually 9 years. 
So if a child at age 10 can get married, did, did the sperm fall from the sky? <laughs> no. She had sexual intercourse. You as a parent, did you confidently, were you comfortable discussing that issue with the child? And most likely they'll tell you no. I don't even know how to start a conversation about my child's sexual health with him or her. I don't know. Most parents don't. You see them say, say, <laughs> so that means the mother or the father knows that she's engaging in something. <clears throat> so they know that the Guarama I am a big call, she don't have a decision, so boss Roma. And they leave it at that. They don't want to think beyond the cause that there could be sexual activities going on. Uh, can we say that we are in denial? We are in denial. Yeah, we are in denial, and that is the, the, the root cause of all of this. Okay. I say that the approach that was used in raising our parents are entirely different. Yeah. But that's not to say that our parents didn't have babies at age 12 or 13. They did. You see? But at their time, they were limited infections or virus that you could, mm-hmm. you know, gets yeah. as a result of your sexual activity and it was normalized child marriage was normalized you get pregnant no one did, people didn't see it as a problem yeah, because there was yeah. no education yeah. that could stop you from feathering your no there was nothing like that so yeah. when you get pregnant they just it's accepted you. as normal <laughs> so they just take it yeah. or in fact they get excited but, about yeah. it and they push you to get married they just yes. uh, it means you're a woman <laughs> <enough. laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then again, at their time, they had a lot of resources around them that didn't require much hard work or what we call um, the white collar job that we now get okay. as a result of education. So a household of 10, and each person could get 100 acres to farm, 50 acres to farm on their own. So if you choose to come out and farm, you'll make your money. Now take Tamale for instance and compare it to 10 years back. This area didn't exist. That means people were farming here. Now it's been occupied. So those who were farming here, what happens to them? Financial stress. Financial stress. So then the education becomes very important. And so when a child gets pregnant at an age that they can no longer get um, education, then the financial burden becomes a problem. And that we can all keep farming because there is no more land mm-hmm. enough. But there are other options that we can explore. So that's the difference between what we are dealing with now and what they dealt, they dealt with. with. So giving them information is very important. Age appropriate, let me be specific. Age appropriate information. So at age 10, what should my child know? They know that, oh, you are growing breast because you're a girl. I say, girl, you have a vagina, you know that. I said, boy, you have a penis, you know that. And when you are growing, it becomes bigger. You know that. You get hair, you know that. Take it step by step. So when you build that trust and they become comfortable in discussing anything with you, when they, a child or an adult approach them about sexual activity, they will come to and come to discuss that with you. So giving them age appropriate information is very crucial to getting um, us to minimize these HIV related issues because then they know they can protect themselves, they can use condom. I tell myself that those days I was working with Savannah Signatures, anytime you meet me, anytime, there are condoms in my bag. Am I bad? No. It could get to months and I'll not even use it. But they are always in my bag. I work with young people. I give it to them. Because I'm not going to be in denial that they don't have sex. I know they do. Yeah, just you just mentioned condom. I remember that there was a time I went for this one of this um uh, activism program with an organization. I realized that from the conversation throughout they mentioned condom but the thing was to prevent pregnancy, not uh, 
HIV. HIV or, or any other STDs. STD. Yeah. yeah. So and I'm looking at okay the education. Have we missed out somewhere? Like we are more focused on the ch- uh, the girl getting pregnant and dropping out of school yeah. than the associated uh, diseases, such as yeah. uh, STDs. Yeah. That comes with it. Exactly. We have. I think at a point we're more focused on just uh, ending teenage pregnancy yeah, yeah. And, and denying that infections or so as exactly. yeah. that could affect the child. Um, I don't know whether we're thinking that children don't get HIV, but we, we missed that point big time. And up to now, um, they tell you use condom to protect yourself from pregnancy. pregnancy yeah. <laughs> but that's not it. Yeah. So they tell you. Um, and I used to have this problem with the way we communicated about sexual reproductive exactly. issues. You go to the community and you say ways to prevent pregnancy, then you say, or ways of having healthy sexual activity, then they say use the withdrawal method. <laughs> withdrawal as a healthy yeah. method wow. that's impossible because. Aside the fact that when the ejaculation is happening, one is no longer their senses, <laughs> and so withdrawal may not work, it's also a recipe for disaster when it comes to STI infections, sexual transmitted infections. Yeah. It will happen because the person then say, okay, so maybe if I use withdrawal, I'll not get pregnant. But completely, if taking their thoughts or their reflections away from the bigger issue of yeah, STI. Yeah. And then the issue of, of, of multiple partners come to play. And the financial burden we spoke about earlier, that now a lot of young people are forced to become adults as children. They have to take care of their families. Their mom or their dad is old and can no longer work. They have to take care of them. Or they themselves just want to live a luxurious life that they can't afford. So they tend to engage and have multiple sexual partners. And you never know. The people you are engaging with, how many of them could be sexually, uh, who have an infection. So of late, we hear a lot of women talking about how they were not, um, they were HIV negative. They were not positive before they got married. Now they are with their husbands and they go to the hospital maybe with their second child and they are told that they are HIV positive. Mm-hmm. And then they tell their husband and he refuses to go do the test. Because he already knows what he has done. Yeah. He knows what's in him. So that's the irresponsible um, nature of some of the adults that we are dealing with. Mm-hmm. And so they know that once I can afford the money and I give the child um, I give a girl small money, I can have sexual activity with them. So all of these factors are things that we really need to pay attention to when we are talking about uh, reproductive health. We need to look at the financial uh, implications. We need to look at the society as a whole, our beliefs, our practices, the norms that we hold dear to our hearts. Are we willing to come make some little compromises so that at least at the end of the day, you are not losing your culture entirely, but you are also making room for the adjustments exactly. and the new um, approaches life is, is, is bringing, so that you, you can deal with it um, appropriately. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, as you are right? <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> In fact, uh, the discussion um, is, is getting much more interesting. And um, this is to say, according to our explanation, parenting plays a role here. Okay. okay. So I, I don't know what what are you doing, I say, to at least draw the attention of the parents to such issues. And yeah. Especially letting them know that they have. They, they, they should, it's a must for them to speak to their children concerning these things. Yeah, thank you. I think that um, I've always said this that any intervention that targets only the girl child without their guardians is likely gonna fail. 
Because when you give the information to the child, where would they practice it? Mm. At home or in school. Mm. So if you gather a group of girls, mm. they come for a summit, and then you tell them you have the right to get information about your sexual reproductive health, you need to use condom when you are having sex, you do, 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 blah, 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 blah. And then the girl will go and buy condom and put it in her bag. And she gets home. Unfortunately for her. <laughs> her mom searches her bag <laughs> and see the condom. <laughs> Help me. Can you imagine what's going to happen? <laughs> yes. So any education, sexual productive of education, that focuses on only the children without their parents is gonna fail and that's how come we we are still here with so many interventions for for empowering young people and we still have some of these people getting pregnant getting infected and safe abortions and all that so as NGOs or government interventions that seek to address the issue of um, um, sexual productive health is very important when we are going into intervention. You target, should I say, four main people. One is the school management of uh, the management of the school. Yeah. So you can look at the school management committee, the PTA that's in the school, and then the leadership of the school in general. So GES, very important. The second group of people you have to look at are the traditional leaders in the community. You need to get them to understand. And I'm not saying they'll go in and tell them that uh, this their practice of child marriage is terrible. So we are here to tell you that you should stop pushing children into marriage. They'll suck you. You need to approach them appreciating their values what led to children being forced to marry okay. and why there's a change and they must try to make adjustments so when i used to do this in uh, engagement i go to the community and i tell them so your time as a mother did you have a telephone you say no so okay did you have television no was there technology no. Yeah. And I say now is there TV or not? Do you watch TV? Yes. Sometimes the things you see on TV does it scare you? You hear them know them. Mm. Especially with music videos. Yeah. Mm. Then they you ask them, so when you yeah. see it, how do you feel? It scares me for my child. Mm. So that's why you need to give her the information before she gets it on the TV. So if you don't tell her and she sees what's on the TV, that's her first point of information. So she picks it as the right thing. She doesn't see anything wrong with wearing bikini and shaking your buttocks in the video. Because it's now normal for her. Each time she turns on the TV, she's likely to see something like that. So that means that's become a norm for her. And we say that, um, I mean, let me just use an example of this LGBT issue. We are fighting it because if it becomes a law, it, be, it becomes normal, then it's no longer wrong. Yeah. We have accepted it. But with a bill, not, I mean, with it not being um, legal, there is still fear and it can't be publicly displayed. And that's the rationale behind a lot of the protest against the bill yes. so we don't want it to be a norm so get the information to her first so the way she sees it she sees that there's something wrong with this and i tell you she's not gonna get that information from the church or the mosque because what we are doing there is morality we are talking about morality in relation to what our prophet did what jesus christ did we are not going to tell her that because we ourselves we don't even want to believe that yes. <laughs> we practicing. think those in the music videos yes, yes. are possessed by evil spirits or something but no 
So they are going to get that information, and she won't get it from the church or the mosque, mm. but from you and the school. Now the third group of people are the parents mm. that you need to get to understand that we are coming to your school. The information we are giving your children, this is it. When they come home, they are likely to practice some of the things we are teaching them. Mm. When they do, and you are not setting, you are not sure, you are afraid as a parent, get back to us. Then we can guide you. That means the child is probably misapplying or misinterpreting the information you give and they are, they are taking the wrong path. Then the fourth group is now the children themselves. So that they understand, they get the information, the parents get it, the school gets it, the traditional leaders and the religious leaders, they, they get it. So with all of these group having the information, when one is practicing it, it's no longer going to be a problem. So it's not like the youth activism that we are, like we've moved all the first three and we are using only And one. that's why it's failing. Yeah. That's why as an NGO, you go to a community, introduce a project, Two years, three years, you finish. And the next time you go back there, three of your club members are pregnant. <laughs> you are asking yourself, is it that I didn't do things well? Yes, you didn't. Yeah. You didn't engage the relevant stakeholders. Mm. You didn't get the people to appreciate the rush down. And a lot of, you know, sometimes I sit back and I listen to our younger people growing up talk about issues about rights and I smile not because I'm so excited about the information they give they have the information all right but I'm afraid about the approach they use to deliver the information mm -hmm. when you stand before elderly people trust me you have to find a different way to give Information. information you have given to 15 year or 18 year old people don't treat them like they don't know no they'll just be listening to you then you finish and they'll tell you so you 18 years or 20 years you think you can come and tell me yeah. they've been in existence for decades what are you talking about mm. approach them with the generational gap issue because a lot of them fact is they don't know how to do, talk to their children now because there's a gap. In their time, they are still trying to use the old ways of raising the child in this era, which wouldn't work. So what you have to do is to base your conversation on findings of research of current generation as against their generation and present it logically. Then they will now not and reflect and understand why my child I have to hit her 10 times before she will wash that bowl or I have to explain to her why she should not um, have a, a, a friend but if you tell them trap her bring that child your friend to the house let us know him or her if ever she's pregnant you know who is pregnant her. but if you deny that she doesn't have a boyfriend then she goes out doing it she will pay money, she will come and ask her who you pay she doesn't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Well, a lot has been discussed, but from your side, who do you think should take majority of the blame of the our current situation? Hmm. That's a very difficult one. Because I say it's a collective responsibility. So it's difficult to pinpoint and say that let's blame government. We can say that resources are not available enough at the facilities. We have not made deliberate efforts to integrate HIV as any other ailment that exists in our communities. We are still treating it as a standalone disease. And so when you even hear people say I'm HIV positive, then it still becomes a problem. But can we track? Yeah. They give you that look. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they give you that look. Yeah, yeah. You know. So let's try from the government providing enough resources, integrating it as part of medical services yeah. that we provide. 
let's make it a non-discriminatory issue let's try to take the stigma away then people can be more comfortable if you observe if you go for conferences or meetings where participants freely discuss a variety of issues a lot of people come out with challenges you you wouldn't know existed because the, the environment is safe so you feel like if i yeah. let it out my first hiv testing that i did willingly was at accra uh, national conference center and that was organized by the then first lady together with uh, first ladies of africa the yeah across the the, the, the continent yeah yeah so i i went in and then i did it when it my results came out i was super excited mm-hmm. because they had set up uh, a center you could just walk in and do your test and come out and yeah so this is a safe environment but can government take up that i know right now covid has come to <laughs> slow a whole lot so, yeah. but efforts must be made at least by december when we are celebrating world is day we know that we have made some strides in fighting against it especially mm-hmm. among um, young people yeah. then we also look at parents let's open up we do who are enlightening a bit let's talk to our parents to understand i always say this that my genius sister at age or during a dhs this she already had a boyfriend but we all knew because we told her, let him come to the house, we want to meet him. So he comes, they sit outside, they talk, and she comes inside. But were we bad? No. At a point, she told us everything about that relationship. When it ended, we all knew. Her next boyfriend, we knew. SS, so she moved. UDS, we knew who she was dating. So we are not controlling the child. We are giving them the flexibility to take decision and be responsible for that decision they are making but if you the parents say that my child doesn't have a boyfriend you have made a decision for her so when she comes out with pregnancy you are taking responsibility for that decision <laughs> as a parent what if you allow her to take that she knows the consequences of that decision whatever it happens or if it backfires it's on her so that's how we tracked her and up until now yeah she's not a big girl she does whatever she wants no one cares i was telling my sister that so we all just know that she's having sex then she, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah we are not in denial, in denial yeah. no not anymore yeah. I'm just, I'm just looking at the previous aspect. Yeah. In fact, in fact, we, yeah, the previous really have to change ways of doing things. Yeah. Because this modern world that we are living in, I was once, I, I, I had an encounter that was a salary, just the one we celebrated, yeah. even at her. So I was just in the compound and some guys came and asked me, Afa, the bank has So I told them, Chabeka Kana. So I told them, Chabeka Kana can tell you, Ibarka Rasala. One little boy, like, let me just say, six years or five years boy. So he was approaching, hearing me say, said to the others that, Chameka Kanama, Obama Kanama, no, even Dung Bagans or Kay, you know, and Barkara, so any Chamka Kara. He just came into the Afa and Chamka Kanama and Kara. So he said, Oh, my uncle from Karabian, you burn a child and I do my work via Bobby. So at least my dunk to put to me the shell no while, please, ma'am. They should do a lot. And then yeah, I think that we've been in denial of the current situation that we are in is influencing what, how we are suffering now. So yeah. if you really accept that they are practicing it, now if you accept that means you're not going to look at how are we going to solve the issue or how are we going to mitigate what's happening. Yeah. So yeah, I think yeah. we need to stop being in denial and accept the fact that it's happening. That yeah. And we need to also be very realistic with the parents we are dealing with and not assume that immediately you tell them as a parent you need to sit your child down and talk to them get let them know the issues they'll take it immediately mm-hmm. no mm-hmm. it won't work yeah, i used to say that i'll go to communities 
to engage um, community leaders mm -hmm. and for three times I'll meet them the first time we'll talk and talk and talk and I'll never mention the, the reason I'm there mm -hmm. second time we talk and talk I'll never tell them why I'm there because I'm trying to build a rapport that when I finally come in with that information they know that this person wants what's best for our children so I could meet them talk about their olden days we share a history they tell me what 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 and I'll never mention sexual productive help okay because the moment they hear that word no they won't give you the audience oh, yeah. so you just said it like you can meet uh, three to four times yeah. and you don't even mention it yeah so I'm looking at uh, this this current uh, activism about this so sexual and reproductive self is it more about because it's like it's more about one day they just go one day go and organ bring it, it people together work. that's why we still have so no like the problem. approach I don't know I think there's a word someone that the trainer of trainer like mm -hmm. yeah because like you have this movement doesn't mean that you can train people or you can go and talk to people about these things so let me tell you my Savannah signatures days and the sexual productive health trainings I underwent I think about three times okay all five days each before I was finally certified as a master trainer in okay. sexual reproductive health wow. so that means and this was done by our um, Dutch pastors okay. they come to Ghana spend a week with you and train you go back come again train you three times the fourth time they do not certify you with the certificate so that means can we say that all those going around doing this they education need, they need more capacity. capacity they don't have the skill yet mm -hmm. they have the knowledge yeah. which is theoretical so but how can we control this activity because it's like they are doing more harm than uh good but yeah. if you don't really know the information or the work that you are doing, then that means what you are doing, uh, impacting or you are going to do, that means you are not, it's just zero. Okay, it's the regulation. The question. Yeah. Not necessarily they are doing more harm. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But, uh, like, uh, let's say that they are not doing more harm, but is it helping? Because, uh, because they, they go there, they talk to them, so they haven't done anything mm -hmm. wrong. Yeah. They have to talk. Like the communication has been the problem. Yeah. So, how can we like find a way to help train these people? Because they have the energy to go. Like you said in the before discussion, uh, most of you are now engaged in other things. That has um, stopped you from moving to these places. So, now that they have the energy and the drive, how can you collaborate? Or how can you help them with that kind of training? Yeah, very good, and thank you for uh, um, that correction. I think that um, they are trying, they are thinking that that approach is helping, but it's it's just information. Yeah. They are not educating them, so they are just giving out information which anyone can get with the help of their phone. Okay. But when it comes to issues of sexual reproductive health, you need a skill and an attitude, a transformed attitude, mm -hmm. to be able to engage people first in a non judgmental manner, such so that when they speak, you understand them and immediately you reflect on their issues mm -hmm. before you can provide responses. You need to look at the fact that. There are people who already have their own mentality. And so your work is not just to give them the information, but to try and transform that negative one into something more positive, helping them in reflecting, not giving them or imposing the information on them. And that's where the challenge, the challenge comes. If they reflect and see that this is wrong, they are most likely going to change within the shortest time than if you go and give information. You give that information constantly and they take it, they move out and it's gone. Mm -hmm. So that's why there are well designed sexual productive health manuals okay. that you have to use to train teachers. It's separate. To train traditional leaders, separate. To train children. It's separate because it needs more reflective exercises 
than just giving out information. So what I'm saying is this, if the regulators, the regulatory bodies that we have, someone comes to register an NGO, we just register them and they go whatever they then decide to do. No one holds them accountable. But if you know that this particular NGO, ABC, are into sexual reproductive health, and there's a well-designed package of how sexual reproductive health intervention should be operated, if they don't follow that manner, then you know that these people are not going doing things the right way that will be difficult because even the people regulating it they know they, they don't have that much information so for us as people i say that when, when when they call me to come to speak on some of these issues i i go in and i so if you approach my sessions or if you observe what i do when i go for sessions I don't give out information. I tease out issues from people. If you start in any of my panel discussions, I don't come with a long book to, to read out to you. No. I ask you questions and get you to give me responses. And then I correct you based on your responses. That you have you learned something at least. But if I come with a long speech and read that, read that, read that, read that, and I'm done. So what? So it's, I wish they would, they would try to get to certify themselves in the area of sexual reproductive health before they go about giving out information. Because that's the only way we can minimize the, the negative impact of what um, they are probably doing with some of the communities. That's not to say giving out information is bad, not at all. But if you really want to change the attitudes and beliefs of people the mindset you need to be more um, education focused yeah. rather than information focus yeah okay mm -hmm. okay so i think we are just a uh, last question <laughs> to add so um we've talked about all these things now my last question is how can we mitigate all this things that we've discussed yeah so um i think fishbone has money to convince me to, to an extent to go back to my <laughs> activism <laughs> which i think is the first okay. step for me because okay. i think change starts with, with you so I'm, I'm starting the change we go out more with um information age appropriate information very important we go out with information about how to help parents guide their children or train their children. Puts pressure on governments and you know um, policy makers yeah. to see how they can at least consider some of these um, interventions. And if possible, we go back to that conversation of CSC because I think it's very important. And then from we as activists, we need to do a bit more of learning about what we go about talking about. We need to understand it ourselves. We need to appreciate the issues that we are discussing and its impact on the people and to understand that when you give out wrong information, it ruins the whole efforts. So we need to, and I'm willing at least if I spend two, three days with you as an activist for sexual reproductive welfare rights, if we do it consistently for like a month, you should be able to appreciate the approaches that you can use, not the information, the content, because okay. it's all over the place, but the approach you can use to engage and just maybe the cases that we are dealing with now will reduce. Okay. And hopefully in the near future, if government is able to curb mother to child HIV transmissions, I'm very sure and positive in the next in the coming years, we'll have less uh, numbers okay. within the age group that we are looking at because then they would have been protected from their parents yeah. during childbirth and all that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. I I think I have a bonus yeah. question. Now. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be part of this thing, but um, 
back to the seminars and the um, staff division organized as activists. Is it possible that the, the, the three, the 15 B or um, I say 24 D um, this the training you went to, is it possible we can organize some, not only the activists who are going around the but also to maybe the new or incoming school prophets? Mm -hmm. Because they are more uh, like always in touch with the school than you come monthly or quarterly to come and have this discussion then before the grand day. So I'm just thinking, is it ideal that they also the prophets that the the, the, the school prophets mm -hmm. that they, they go through some certain basic training about that. Mm -hmm. So that it they can add it to their morning session, either ensemble or something like that. Or we have school religious talk, we can also have a talk. Mm -hmm. So that they can also communicate. So what they are doing on the daily basis then organizations can visit on quarterly or monthly basis. Then when you have the grand finale one, at least you know that it's in stages. So yeah. they are learning in stages in, in a way. Yeah. That's where my hand can come. Because um, like we're saying about the one day packed event, mm -hmm. if they learn it in stages and you come to the grand finale, at least there's some kind of hierarchy they will be following yeah. to the end. Absolutely. So I, I don't think that we go in there quarterly or monthly mm -hmm. to talk to them constantly. But if it's an everyday thing they practice, then when you come quarterly or monthly, you add up to what they've learned. You receive information for what they've learned. Like you said, either you correct, you can correct certain misinformation. So it becomes a daily conversation mm -hmm. they're having. Because until you die, you can't stop talking about yeah. people. It's not only for young people, even adults. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking. I mean, it's an excellent idea, and if you observe NGOs that have been in existence and are well uh, grounded yeah. in some of these issues, like NOSA, yeah. like PPAG, yeah. Savannah Signatures, you realize that their approach is entirely different. Yeah. You hardly see them organize some media to talk about social reproductive yeah. health. And so, take NOSA for instance, they are not that. Yeah. It's like a whole week, yeah. or three days, or four. Oh, yeah. And then they come, they stay, they have series of sessions before they finally have the, the last summit. So in the case of Savannah's natures, we used to do this through teachers. You train the teachers, they undergo this training several times before you finally certify them and they now become trainers in this school. So they take a day out of the week and have the session with the students with a well-developed manual to guide them in their discussions. So we go do monitoring and observe how they, they do the, the, the teaching and all that. So once that's done, then you know that at the end of the day, these students have gotten the right information. And so now I see a lot of them, they are now in senior high school, they call me sometimes and you know that yes, you made an impact, it worked, yeah. So I think that it's, a, it's an excellent idea. And we can use students, we can use teachers, we can use volunteers, like EPA is doing, so that at least they have constant touch with the students and they can always give out the information in a well guided manner. My last bonus question the chief's palace. I'm just, I'm just thinking, spin Do you think it's high time or cheaper? Now that we have the likes of Pishibuna, like those educated chiefs. Do you think it's high time we also get someone who is an expert or a trainee of cerebral, not to teach the chiefs, but when issues of teenage pregnancy or deadness like this happening, somebody's at the palace who also knows something about it mm -hmm. to be able to handle it. If it has to go for um, HIV test, if they have to see a dorsal person, like someone who also know more about sexual reproductive health rights too, mm -hmm. or even sexual gender based violence. So that the way the chief palace will handle it, because some of the chief doesn't have time to go to the police yeah. station. Mm -hmm. So maybe in I know you uh, plan Ghana has also that do something. With it. If the chief palace could also have somebody there, they can just train one of the community people who is always at the palace. So that when issues like this come up, they also know the right channel to handle it. Because most of it the chief doesn't have time. And when yeah. he says go and do this, as well as they will do it or not. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good idea also to consider um, that approach. Um, I believe that if I become a queen mother someday, 
I would always sexual gender based violence issues differently from any chief that will if um, if they don't have the experience yeah. I have. So in getting them the information, mm-hmm. if you and I are all empowered in this regard and we become leaders one day we'll act differently from what they are doing now. Mm-hmm. So we can get them the information. There are well developed a yeah, plan we have developed some manuals as to how to engage okay. traditional leaders also. So there are well developed manuals that we can use. So in such cases they will have to delegate someone mm-hmm. to be passed so the person become your contact person to deal with such issues. Mm-hmm. And uh, as much as possible, the less settle it at home thing will end, yeah. <laughs> so that at least we can get justice for mm-hmm. children mm-hmm. and victims of yeah. violence. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think I'll go back to Jelly's. Yeah. Okay. So much is my Hey, to plan to be shamo. Kato kule zama lam niango bjala uti chenti ga zanjande ndopen ta Allah ga zanjande shekina kule nekna niyam puhim peta chosha. Lala chama puho se nara kule mchile. August gwe japi ana ndaja denunka langu da lam nari dia le zama zante la ba sa sabrba. Azia Maria Madilai ora tam la ba ti solo kamane. Lala ashipto ma nze chunde chunsha ma dinira so kamza sa dan fa da bane da zan so kan tabson lala shi to na chande da ba ba ne to tubo pulu to zan lala dabson ma yi ta fage da gahlanu bo ne so kan da jiya kai ne ni nuka lala yallo ma ne ne so kan za san ni dela da ne so kan da yi na an tabson kan lala ji ma kan chan zin yaran ga dan kuryar nan ka shi tuma abje ne na kul tabson ne mun kan za sa male da bukata to zan dabson ma te ji ma na kuryar jan shambala Jangan cuma kau berper berlama, kau lain lagi umpan itu sanggah dalam mabuk mata tetapi kerang kau faham. Tapi sanggah itu baru pun dia posia, mesej posia. Let me stress on. Tahu. Umpan yang muda sah. Tahu. Zon adab selma. Dalam kena tina syam bela. Temen beper baka men beper orang mana yang bawa misteri fauzia tua al Hasan. Ne beper berahma tu lay Zakaria. News editor bela mazan ti salah tu zambang. Omin news tu maza tu purba bin yelenga. Ne na wni bi samjale. Bung bung kari kama. Ne mukam gunda. Ayum jandi. YouTube channel zon. Anto subscribe. Sasha kam tiku la bah. Tuk kani baza nyale. Lala nyale abalut untuk comment. Anto zaman lah beti. Oh iya siapa mana? Um saat lama. Ama bahun wakang barang mala. Pihun wakang mala. Alhamdulillah. Tugur dengan mazah sa. Kau zaman itu lab shey. Zaman tazun mana? Kau bang barang yang zaman mazah sa kuar. Kau bera. Kau yang cap sa kau yang al jadu fil jadi wal hermanu fil kesel. Mula di Jamil Mahmud. Dukkan cuma.